Today I want to start by sharing with you a story from my dad's life. My sister and my mom often get featured in my sermons, I think mostly because they are involved in a lot of my shenanigans. Um, but today it's my dad's turn, and unfortunately he's sick today, but I do have his permission to share this story. You might know from talking with my dad, Roger, that he is an avid fly fisherman. In fact, his love for fly fishing was a big influence in Spokane being his first choice of places to move after retiring from the Navy back in 1993, even though we had no ties to the state of Washington. And in the 25 years we've lived here since, he has fished this whole area and beyond, to Idaho, to Montana, to Canada, even Baja, California. Like any fisherman, he's had a bucket list of places he wants to fish in the world. And now that he's really retired, he's starting to check those places off his list. Not long ago, he got to check off one of the biggest, Kamchatka. Who here knows where Kamchatka is? A handful of us, don't feel bad. I'd only ever heard of it because I played the board game Risk a few times. Um, it's a peninsula in the very, very far northeast corner of Russia, like kind of where it connects to Alaska. It's a place that's so remote that you have to take a helicopter to get anywhere. And you have to take a bear dog, because bears. Um, and the bears there have never seen people, and so they're not afraid of you, and will just walk up to you and think you're a tasty morsel. <laughs> Given the location, and fishing being my dad's <laughs> ultimate goal, he had carefully packed the necessary clothing, equipment, and fishing gear that was needed. Things like a sleeping bag and a pillow, of course, changes of clothing, a, a hat and a bandana, toiletries and mosquito and bear repellent. Of course, he would need a fly rod and a fishing reel, waders and flies, you know, all the things that you would usually pack on a fishing trip to the back country of a remote Russian peninsula. <laughs> he packed all this very carefully in one bag that met the weight limit, and all in preparation for this great adventure he had been waiting a lifetime to go on. There was just one tiny problem when they arrived in the back country of Kamchatka. After hopping out of the helicopter and watching it fly away with plans to return after a week to pick him and the other intrepid fishermen on the trip, my dad discovered the guides had failed to unload his bag. With no way to communicate with the Circa World War II helicopter to say, hey, come back! My dad was facing a week of braving the elements of this remote Kamchatkin Peninsula and fishing with what he had on him, which amounted to the clothes he had worn for the 24 hours of travel it had taken to get there and a tiny little day pack with his wallet and cell phone. And not surprisingly, there was no cell service there. <laughs> he had no sleeping bag, no fishing equipment, no toothbrush, no nothing. For some people, this would be devastating, right? It would ruin the entire trip. How are you going to survive, never mind fish, without your stuff? It would be so easy to just give up and spend a week wallowing in resentment and self-pity wearing your only outfit, watching everyone else fulfill their lifelong fly fishing dream. But that's not exactly what happened. Not to say that there wasn't some irritability regarding the situation and uh, reimbursement later on along the line for the inconvenience. <laughs> Instead, what happened is that the other guys in the group who had all their stuff and had packed a few extras willingly shared with my dad out of their abundance. Some clothes here, a bottle of sunscreen there, even an extra rod, reel, and box of flies. And while the clothes didn't fit perfectly, and the equipment wasn't exactly what he was used to, they were functional, and generously given, and gratefully accepted. Beggars really can't be choosers in the backcountry of Kamchatka. <laughs> and so you know what? Despite the debacle of being without everything he needed to fulfill his mission of fishing there, in the end, he got to fish. A lot. Apparently in Kamchatka, every time you throw it a line, you catch something. The fish are so abundant there. It's, what is the word you use for fish who grab on really great? Fishy? 
Isn't there a word for that? Dumb. <laughs> Stupid. Um, I was like, you know, gamey or something. All right. <clears throat> they, they caught so many fish, my dad got tired of fishing. It was too easy. And he was so busy enjoying the fishing and the beautiful scenery and fulfilling his goal of being the Kamchatka that he didn't even care that his stuff had been left behind, that he was in borrowed clothes, living off the hospitality and generosity of others. He was getting to fulfill this life's dream, to fish in Kamchatka, and that's all that mattered. I share this story to help us understand what Jesus was trying to do with all the instructions he gave as he commissioned the 72 in Luke's gospel. He was trying to get them to focus on the mission, on the goal, the purpose, to stay on message, if you will, and to not get sidetracked or discouraged by, well, the things that usually sidetrack and discourage us. And the mission was this. Go out to the places Jesus was about to go, places on the road from Galilee to Jerusalem, and prepare the people there to receive him by driving out evil, healing those with sicknesses, and proclaiming the message that the kingdom of God was coming. All of this they would do with the power and authority Jesus would best possess and would pass on to them. But before he even gives them this basic marching order, Jesus launches into this very detailed list of instructions designed to get ahead of any issues that could prove costly to getting the message out. Issues born of the 72's personal perspectives, procrastinations, and preferences. It's clear from the emphasis that Jesus makes on these, that for his 72 and for the disciples, that they were viewing this movement of his as one that while they were attracted to it, it wouldn't appeal to a larger audience and wouldn't be well met in some places. Jesus admits that, yes, this is risky. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves, but you're wrong about the scarcity of those who want to hear it. Jesus conveyed to them through this language of harvest and labor is that they can actually expect this message to be much more greatly received than they could ever imagine. That there are so many waiting to hear this message that they're going to be delivering. That he's asking them before they even go, in addition to facing the risks, to pray. To pray that more will join the 72 so they can expand the reach of Jesus' message and the preparation for who he is even more so. And so rather than going forth with this perspective of scarcity regarding the reception they will receive, Jesus wants them to change their perspective and to go forth expecting people will want to hear what they have to offer and to ask God to work so that others join up with them. Jesus also gives some very specific instructions that draw their focus away from the tendency to procrastinate when given a costly task. Any procrastinators in the room? <laughs> That's what I thought. It's a human condition, right? The situation is very urgent, however, and there can be no procrastination. In chapter 9 of Luke, Jesus had first commissioned his 12 disciples to carry forth the very same mission he's now passing on to the 72. And when the original 12 returned, Jesus then shared with them the real cost to all this, the reason there's urgency. And that's because he has to make his way to Jerusalem and he has to suffer and die there, but also be miraculously resurrected. And so at the end of that same chapter, Jesus turns his face to Jerusalem and begins the journey from the Galilee to the city where he will face his death with plans to stop in all the cities and towns along the way, to preach, to heal. And these are the cities he's sending the 72 ahead. With time fleeting before his impending death, it is imperative to Jesus that the message of the kingdom of God and the salvation that he is bringing be made available to everyone possible as soon as possible. To get them going now, he instructs them not to take their wallets, don't take your bags, don't take any extra shoes. Not only would all that extra stuff just weigh you down and slow you down, it would take time to organize and pack it all up. And there isn't time for that. There isn't even time to make polite, polite chit chat with fellow travelers on the road to wherever they're sent. So don't even greet people until you get to where you have been assigned. If you stop and say hi, you're just delaying the delivery of the message that much more. Keep moving until you get to your assigned town. And once you're there, get about the message. Share God's peace. 
Now this isn't some nice greeting. This peace, this message of peace is a message of God's shalom, the promise of God's salvation for all, the message people need to be hearing to be prepared to meet Jesus, to be prepared to meet the one who is God's salvation, sent to save the whole world. And because time is short, if people listen, great. If they don't, keep moving. Don't argue with them. Don't get caught up trying to figure out why they turned you down. Don't get discouraged. Keep moving on to the next person and keep sharing the message. Lastly, Jesus deals with the hardest distraction, personal preference. Who can blame any of the 72 for wanting nice accommodations? To pick where they stay based on their preference for the type of place it is and the food that will be served? It totally makes sense. They would want to be ensured they're offered clean food, you know, ritually clean food, not just sanitary. But again, there's no time for that. It's irrelevant. This mission is about the message. Wasting time vacillating over room and board has nothing to do with the message and everything to do with the messenger. And the priority of this mission supersedes any preferences of any of the 72 messengers. And that's Jesus' big point here. The message must get out if the world is to be prepared for what God is doing through Jesus. Through his ministry, his death, and eventual miraculous resurrection, Jesus will fulfill God's mission of bringing salvation to all people. And the people need to be prepared if that mission is to succeed. The need is real. There's no time to waste. And while you should never shoot the messenger, in this case, you also shouldn't cater to them. The cost of carrying this miraculous message of God's salvation means the 72 giving up their scarcity-driven perspectives, their feet-dragging procrastination, and their self-serving preferences. They will follow all these instructions. If they'll stay on task, then they'll complete their mission and they can expect to help expand the reach of God's salvation in the kingdom. And they did. The 72 did follow the instructions. And while they might argue it cost them a great deal in weird accommodations and no extra pairs of shoes, they successfully expanded the reach of God's salvation to the cities and towns they visited. And as we read, they returned overjoyed, surprised even, by what they were able to achieve with Jesus' power and authority. Power and authority that from the very beginning God had given to Jesus with the intention that Jesus give it away. Give it away so that he could share with the whole world this ultimate purpose, this ultimate mission, this good news of God's salvation. This power and authority was never meant to be exclusive. Rather, it was intended to be exponential. Given first to Jesus to expel evil, heal people of sickness, and proclaim the kingdom of God, then passed to his 12 disciples to do the same. And then to the 72, always with the same instructions, go and share, prepare people to receive the good news. But that message didn't stop with the 72. <clears throat> After Jesus' death and resurrection, the book of Acts chronicles the continued expansion of the kingdom message to those gathered on Pentecost who by the power and authority of the same Holy Spirit who descended upon Jesus at his baptism, descended upon them all giving them the ability to speak all the languages of the known world so they could go forth to dispel evil, heal the sick, and proclaim the kingdom of God. And they did. They spread it to communities, establishing it in Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi, and beyond to Europe and Asia. Through time and space and place, apostle after apostle has inherited this commission, has measured the cost, has received the power and authority and has expanded the message of the kingdom of God from place to place to now, to here, to us. Like those who've been commissioned before us, we've received the message of God's intention for global salvation through Jesus Christ. And we've also received the task of sharing it with others, of preparing others for what Jesus is doing in our world. And like those who have gone before us, it's going to cost us. It's going to cost us in the same form of having to change our perspectives, of having to jettison our procrastination tactics, and having to set aside our personal preferences for how the work is carried out. 
We might want to argue that our context is a little different than the original 72, and that might be true to a certain extent. We're not going to necessarily travel on foot. We have cars for that. But the nature of and the need of the commission remains the same. God's spirit has always been and is continuing to create a harvest of people who are ready and in need of hearing the good news of the kingdom of God, who are waiting to hear a message of salvation available to them and to all. The problem is, just as when Jesus sent forth the 12 and sent forth the 72, there aren't enough workers willing to bring in the harvest. In our tendency to, to not like to be uncomfortable or unsafe or at the mercy of others or to bother someone or impinge upon them, we've also lost our sense of the priority of the message over the needs and wants of the messenger. And we are burdened by the personal cost required to carry it out. It seems then that this season of Lent, this time of personal examination and reflection, a, scene, a season set aside for us to look within, could be a time of, of being real with ourselves regarding this commission we've inherited, of taking time to focus on who we are as disciples and what we've been asked to do as inheritors of this commission. It's a time to ask ourselves what is really getting in the way of us sharing the good news with others? What does it really cost us in terms of our perspectives, procrastination, tactics, and preferences? What are my perspectives, procrastination, tactics, and preferences? And what do I have to do to give them up, to receive the power and authority of the Holy Spirit to be an empowered and authorized messenger of the gospel? Because in just five very short weeks, We'll be celebrating that day when God's salvation rose from the dead, when Jesus conquered death and showed the whole world that sin and death hold no claim on those who believe. And there are many, so many, who have never heard that good news, who are waiting for someone to prepare them to receive the miracle of God's salvation already given to them. We've been given that message. We've been given the power and authority to deliver it, but it will cost us. It will cost us the belief that the kingdom of God is shrinking rather than continuing to expand. It will cost us our excuses, our reasons for dragging our feet or for avoiding our commission altogether. And it will cost us our service to ourselves. But the prize the miracle of salvation for all the world will be priceless and worth everything we have to bring it about. So as we move ever closer to the miracle of Easter, let us consider the cost that we are asked to pay. Let us refocus ourselves on the mission and the message so that all might experience that miracle with us. And let us pray for more to join us in sharing the message. Amen. Our hymn of reflection.